Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I will indeed be talking about multi-track audio plugins um, and how they might be used in research and beyond. Um, so by multi-track audio effect plugins or multi-track VSDs, um, I mean uh, an audio effect that has more than the usual two or maybe even beyond the um, eight inputs and outputs. Um, and uh, things I would like to convey during this talk is why you would want such a thing, um, as well as challenges that uh, we've encountered um, creating those. So I guess by way of um, justification of my being here, uh, I'm a, a PhD student at the Center for Digital Music, um, which is a music technology research group um, at Queen Mary University of London, just down the road. Um, as music tech um, research goes, it's quite a large group with over 60 academics, uh, postdocs, uh, PhD students, um, and um, many of those have actually at some point, um, or maybe even currently, uh, created VST plugins, and um, all of those actually, or at least all the ones I've talked to, um, have used Juice to, um, to create those. Um, most, um, but not all, of the people who have at some point created these VST plugins um, are from the area of uh, audio engineering, so within music technology, which is quite um, a wide field, I suppose, um, and um, also a field that we're starting to call intelligent music production, uh, in which I am active as well. Um, so first off, why um, do we create plugins, and why do why are researchers interested in creating VSTs and um, uh, using Juice or something similar? So first off, um, the great thing about plugins is, th is that it allows rapid prototyping of um, ideas, uh, just to validate uh, a concept, um, testing uh, algorithms, implementation of algorithms, um, emulating or, or um, I guess prototyping software um, that may later on become a, a standalone application. Or even hardware can be modeled in, a, in the form of a, a plugin as well. Um, and researchers specifically um, are often interested, um, or at least I am, and, and I know a couple of other people um, are, um, in collecting data um, uh, from, from uh, music producers and people active in music technology and um, um, and for this compatibility with the existing commercially available digital audio workstations and other software is obviously a huge plus. Um, generally, and I think this goes for everyone, uh, a plugin allows you to focus uh, just on the processing, specifically created with Juice, allows you to just focus on the processing, just on the DSP, which is really nice. Um, so um, especially using Juice, again, you don't really have to uh, think about uh, dependence on, uh, on operating system and so on. Uh, you can just create it and it will basically work out of the box in theory. Um, and uh, I guess the greatest thing about this is that you um, don't have to worry about anything that happens between the hardware input and the point at which it reaches your algorithm. You can just think about the DSP. And uh, audio is in, is in real time, um, which is also necessary for some applications, maybe with a live uh, audio stream coming in and so on. And again, specifically in uh, Juice or something similar, um, the interface is very straightforward to make. You, don't, you can make an interface in a matter of minutes uh, rather than hours or even days, um, which is uh, very great for uh, researchers in particular because we don't really care about interfaces most of the time. Um, and uh, to speak on behalf of my colleagues um, who also use Juice or uh, who make plugins for the research, um, Juice encourages good coding practice, uh, makes our life a lot easier, um, and it's generally very well thought through, uh, well integrated, and just great. Um, so why would you ever want to make a multi-track audio plugin? Um, first of all, if you're interested in some kind of cross-adaptive functionality where maybe the processing of track six depends on uh, the audio features extracted from track one, um, then such an architecture is quite hard to make unless you have uh, a plugin that takes many, many inputs uh, at the same time and maybe outputs a lot of um, audio streams as well. Um, some of these functionalities you might be able to 
uh, to make by clever side chaining if your digital audio workstation supports it. Um, but it requires a lot of setup and um, and it's it's very limited, I guess. Um, so that's another reason right there. If you want to model a larger system um, where for instance, you have multiple audio streams interacting with each other, um, then a, then a multi-track plugin is something you would need as well. Uh, for instance, let's say you want to make an um, emulation of a, a, a multi-track tape recorder and see how the different tracks bleed into each other or something, um, which I'm sure is a bad example. Don't do that. Um, but something like that, a VST plugin, uh, would be useful as well. And uh, the setup is just quite simple if you um, imagine just putting a plugin, um, in some situations at least, that you can just put on a multi-track bus rather than uh, many, many different instances of the plugin on different tracks, then uh, this type of architecture is also quite convenient. And finally, but maybe quite importantly, um, if you have spatial applications that are outside of the, the usual 5.1, 7.1 stereo sound, um, you might want a, a plugin to, for example, pan uh, an object or, or a sound source between 20 different speakers or more, in which case this type of multi-track plugin architecture is also quite important. Um, so I think uh, this type of multi-track plugin could actually be relevant not just to researchers, but also developers, um, artists, and so on. Um, I'm quite sure that whenever people give three examples and then say and so on, there's probably only three examples, but maybe someone can think of, uh, of something else as well. Uh, I guess this covers basically everyone here. Um, but um, so this is just a, the theory uh, allowed me to uh, maybe make my point a bit better by actually showing some of the work that we've done um, in the form of a multi-track uh, audio plugin. So this is an example of uh, what we call automatic mixing um, algorithms. Uh, and this is implementing an uh, automatic fader algorithm, which if and when a track is active, tries to put it at sort of equal loudness of other tracks. Um, and you can do some more advanced things as well. Um, similarly, you can have a, an EQ like this one. This is an algorithm that uh, checks for masking between all the different tracks coming in. Um, could be up to, I don't know, 100 or maybe more and um, attenuates certain frequency bands to uh, make other sources more audible and so on. It does a couple of other things as well. Um, the automatic delay correction plugin is an implementation of an um, uh, algorithm, um, again, developed at uh, Center for Digital Music, um, which if you have different audio streams, uh, let's say there are different microphones at various distances from the same drum kit or piano, um, and it aligns them so that, um, so that you don't get this comb filtering, which you get if, uh, if there's delays between different audio sources. So this does that with uh, near sample accurate, um, with, with sample uh, accuracy. Um, a bit more out there, someone actually made a listening test completely in a digital audio workstation using the different tracks coming in um, and then just making the interface very quickly in Juice. Uh, I'm sure you could make a, a complete uh, listening test in Juice as well. I'm sure it's been done. Um, and as a, a final example of this um, type of thing, uh, a semantic comp compressor is an example of um, a semantic plugin which actually uses uh, musical or semantic information embedded in the audio stream rather than the usual low level features. Um, and for instance, uh, you could compress major chords more than minor chords if you would do, want to do that for uh, some reason. Or, um, if they, um, if the, tr if track six has drums, um, then maybe they're compressed differently. If uh, track one, the piano, uh, plays a different chord or is in a different part of the song, and so on. Um, so it's quite interesting as well. Um, there's a couple of other examples um, of things that have been uh, done at our group using Juice. Um, in this case, this is a Foley designer, so basically um, it's a full application in Juice, not a plugin, uh, but it also has multiple streams of sensor data, uh, which are sampled at audio rates, so I guess it's quite similar as well um, to create Foley, so sound effects. Um, the touch keys, um, if you're not familiar with them, are these little plates that you can stick on piano keys and they sense where your finger is um, on the key. Uh, and it's not exactly an audio plugin, it's completely MIDI, but I guess it's multi-channel as well because the way it deals with um, the vibration on the keys, not unlike the, the Seaboard over there, um, is to actually make a separate MIDI channel for every voice 
Um, so I guess this counts as a multi-channel MIDI um, the, uh, application. There's a, a lot of other things. Um, I won't go into detail on that because I simply don't have the time. Um, a lot of examples of non-multitrack plugins uh, that are also interesting for research. Uh, one of them will, will actually um, be explained this afternoon uh, in Sean Enderby's talk. So this is a project together with Birmingham City University, the semantic audio feature extraction plugins. Um, so at this point, um, I hope I've conveyed that there's at least a case for uh, multi-track plugins in this type of architecture to do research, or maybe even other things. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Um, but at this point, I'd like to discuss a couple of the challenges we've come across uh, that are inherent to the development of multi-track audio plugins. So first of all, uh, most digital audio workstations simply don't support it. Um, there are only a couple of examples uh, of digital audio workstations that uh, have proper multi-track VSC supports. Some of them um, obviously support 5.1, 7.1 mixing, um, and maybe up to like eight, eight uh, several channels um, per track. Um, notable examples that do support it, um, Reaper is one that we actually use quite a lot. It's uh, rather open and very flexible. Uh, the routing options are quite, um, quite extensive as well. Um, and this is basically what we use all the time for running this type of uh, multi-track plugin architecture. Um, another example, but this is less conventional as uh, digital audio workstations go, is Audio Mulch. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the nice thing about this is that you can actually visually um, connect the uh, inputs and outputs of the different devices and plugins. Um, Pro Tools is another case entirely. Um, uh, as you might be aware, um, it's not even possible for us to create a signal track um, plugin um, because we're not really um, allowed to use the AEX uh, SDK, so we're not able to develop this for research or to quote the um, audio plugin development program uh, page on the Avid website. You must be willing to make your product available for commercial sale to end users. Uh, we don't offer our developer materials or services for academic use, experimentation, or, quote, just to check them out, unquote. Um, so this basically excludes any kind of use within the academic environment, which is um, quite a pain in the neck because um, we're, as I said, quite interested in getting a lot of information from music producers and how they use their tools and so on. Um, and when arguably still the industry standard, the AW, doesn't support that, then that excludes a whole group of potential users, which is uh, quite sad. But um, compatibility issues aside, there's also a, co a couple of other things that go with uh, the creation of multi-track audio plugins. Uh, one of them is complexity. Obviously, when you have more tracks, uh, your code will probably become a bit longer. Um, so I find myself using a lot of these juice structures like he block, which you might have come across, uh, and owned array. Um, both of those are quite um, good for maybe uh, creating a, uh, a filter uh, or whatever object for each channel and so on. Um, and my code also includes a lot of these lines, so basically do this for every possible track. But with great complexity comes great CPU. Um, so if you, if you have a, a large number of tracks, um, supposedly your um, CPU load uh, scales linearly with this, or maybe even worse, when you've got interdependencies between all these different uh, tracks or channels, um, and the cross-adaptive functionality of which I have shown a few examples. So for the first time, uh, academics like me need to think about uh, efficiency and making code that actually runs uh, quite well, because if you've got code that uh, runs at 2% CPU for a single track um, plugin, then um, if you've got 50 tracks, then obviously it's eating up uh, all of your computer's resources. So efficiency actually becomes critical in this case, um, and basically you just have to code well. Um, there's a couple of tricks that we can do, like uh, here we were checking for um, um, which tracks were actually active, so is there any, anything going on in this track, uh, in this window? Um, and otherwise just ignore it so that that may or may not reduce your um, CPU load in some situations. But basically you just have to be mindful of, uh, of good programming practice and making things efficient. Um, a last challenge which I want to um, mention is if you do need interfaces um, that are sort of easy to use, um, there's 
the way I see this, there's two roads to go down to. So either you can make one large complex interface where you visualize all the features that you're interested in um, and all the uh, parameters that you would want to um, control. This is actually not too bad because there's a lot of parameters that are the same for all tracks. Um, but on the top row, you see all these. Um, this is an automatic panner, by the way, so it pans the different uh, channels depending on the, um, or tracks, I guess, depending on the frequency location, uh, frequency information um, embedded in it. Um, so basically, you have to scroll through all these uh, sliders, which is not the worst, but it's, uh, it's one way to, um, to approach this. The other one being um, to make a, a different page um, I suppose for each track, so you uh, at any given time you only display the features and the parameters um, uh, of one track, and you just uh, click which track you want to visualize. So at this point, I would just like to leave you with a couple of uh, concluding remarks. Um, first of all, I hope I've established that um, there's some unique opportunities um, in uh, the multi-track audio plugin architecture. Um, like audio streams that are cross-adaptive um, processing that's interdependent and basically just allowing complex architectures. Um, but also a unique set of challenges uh, that comes with it, um, most notably compatibility with uh, existing uh, software, the AWs, um, and also complexity, which obviously goes up when you do a lot of cross-adaptive stuff. As I'm sure you've noticed, um, or maybe you knew already, um, the focus of the average academic um, a researcher like me uh, might be quite different from those of industry folks, where um, we are quite often interested in just prototyping an idea, just getting a proof of concept out there, uh, or maybe even collecting data from, uh, from subjects. Whereas um, I would imagine a commercial plugin developer uh, might also be very interested in, uh, in computational efficiency and creating nice looking interfaces. Um, although, as I've um, said um, a minute ago, computational efficiency does become a factor in some cases, obviously when you're researching uh, a very efficient FFT or something, but also if you're just making very complex um, things that otherwise don't run on your computer, then that does, does become a factor. Um, Interfaces are also important uh, whenever someone else is actually using the thing you made, when it's not just you fiddling around with knobs. Um, so there's our two caveats right there. Um, Juice actually supports um, all of this, creating multi-track plugins with uh, basically arbitrary track counts um, uh, quite well. And uh, as I said, enables very quick development in the uh, academic realm, and I'm sure in the um, industry as well. Um, I guess the, the problem is just with uh, the AWs uh, who don't uh, natively support it. Um, so if I am allowed to end on a slightly philosophical note, um, I do think that uh, use cases, or I do acknowledge that use cases for multi-track plugins are quite limited, but I think um, there are a couple of uh, instances in which it's nice to have this kind of uh, architecture. Um, and at the same time, I think support of this kind of architecture could really stimulate development, because right now it's just not an option, so maybe it's not considerate at all. Um, so on that note, I will happily scroll through some references and uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much.